So until about 6 o'clock Thursday night, this segment was going to be about America's crazy addiction to cell phones. But then NPR's Juan Williams lost his job. While on a news program, Williams said this. I'm not a bigot. You know, the kind of books I've written about the civil rights movement in this country. But when I get on a plane, I got to tell you, if I see people who are in Muslim garb, and I think, you know, they're identifying themselves first and foremost as Muslims, I get worried. I get nervous. Well, public radio candom. Maybe to you it's an irrational fear, or maybe it's something that you can actually relate to. I can tell you this. I work with a really intelligent group of people, really unique, and there's even a guy named Ed, our uh, producer. He's in there, too. But when we started talking about it, we really, we really were arguing, and I, I thought it was going to end up uh, with a horse's head in my bed. It got really heated, so we scrapped the smartphones idea, and we decided to take this topic out to you. Why would you be afraid of someone in Muslim garb? You're a, a brown skin guy, right? I am. I'm, all right, tan, whatever. I don't know what your pigment is. I'm more of a green. Uh, I'm so pale. I look like a goblin. But anyway, do you think people look at you when you go to the airport? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll be honest with you. Please. Um, people probably do look at me. I look at people, too. People are comfortable with uh, other folks that, that, that they look like. Well, I think it falls in a category of freedom of speech. You know, everyone is entitled to their opinion. Those stereotypes are out there. You walk down the street and you see somebody looks different than you, I think you do in your head have a, you, you think something, you, there's right. something that pops in your head right. immediately, right. but you don't always necessarily need to say it. I gotta tell you, the shortcomings of coming to a new, new culture is that people not necessarily understand where you're coming from. They think if you speak with an accent, then you, uh, you think with an accent. If you ignore your differences, you're gonna have greater differences and have no more hostility toward, towards each other if you don't talk about it. Well, I'm lucky tonight because my good friend Tim Wise is here to talk about this. He is, hands down, one of the country's most well-known anti-racist activists and speakers and writers. Tim, short but not so simple question. How do, we, right. how do we stop the fear, Tim? Well, number one, we have to recognize that it's irrational. I mean, to generalize about one and a half billion Muslims on the basis of what 19 Muslims did on 9-11 is ignorance on stilts. It makes no more sense than if we were to generalize about Catholics and Christians based on what Tim McVeigh did, which interestingly is a point that Juan Williams was trying to make in a latter portion of that interview, which NBR apparently, you know, ignored. He makes the admission that he has this bias, which I think is a matter of honesty on his part, and then he goes on to try to say, you know, we need to be careful not to generalize. So in other words, he was admitting the bias and then talking about the problem with the bias. To me, that's exactly, as an anti-racism, anti-bias expert and, and educator, what we need to be doing, acknowledging that we have been conditioned to have some of these beliefs and stereotypes, but that if we own it, if we put it out there, if we acknowledge it, we can challenge it. To me, that's what we need to be doing. Now, you also, let's be clear, you, you, you're against the firing of, of Juan Williams, yeah. right? You came out against it. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of what he said, I think, in terms of, you know, yes, we are at war with Islam or something, agreeing with O'Reilly, I think that part was a problem. But the idea that we would fire him for acknowledging his own bias, to me, makes absolutely no sense. All the research on this, and any of us who study this subject know it, uh, all the research says, A, we all have been conditioned to have these biases, so the vast majority of us will. But B, if we acknowledge it, we can actually challenge it and, and prevent ourselves, potentially, from acting on the basis of it. So the idea that we're going to, in any way, help the cause of anti-bias or that we're going to reduce anti-Muslim hysteria by not talking about the fact that this conditioning is real is nonsense. What NPR did wasn't just a disservice to Juan Williams in that regard. It was a disservice to the conversation we need to be having about racial, religious, and other forms of bias. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that we talked about out there uh, on the segment I went out in the street, and we talked about it in our home. W when and where can we talk about these issues? I mean, if you're going to be afraid that if you say something on television or radio where it's being recorded, you're going to lose your job, we'll never have the conversation, although we do have the conversation in the privacy of our own homes, and sometimes even at work, Tim, where and when is it appropriate, or is it always appropriate, and should we not necessarily be afraid of the repercussions of our honesty, even if it does seem ignorant? Well, I think we need to be honest whenever possible. Obviously, there are moments where, you know, you don't want to be sitting across from somebody you just met who happens to be a person of color if you're white or happens to be Muslim if you're not and say, God, you know, I'm really scared of people like you. I mean, that's not maybe the best time to do it. But I do think it is important for us to admit that, you know, the way I say it is advertising works. If we have been exposed to product placement 10, 15, 20 times so that we'll go out and buy a tennis shoe or a type of toothpaste that someone wants us to buy, how much easier is it for us to internalize 
internalized biases that we have been hit with in media, from parents, from schools, from peers, year after year, month after month, day after day. I think we have to acknowledge our, our humanity in that regard, but then problematize the conditioning. It's not okay to say, yeah, I've got these biases and what of it? They're fine. They're not fine. But the only way we're going to get a hold of them, the only way we're actually going to challenge them and diminish them is if we own them, admit the problem, and then try to work together both individually and collectively to make the place better. Yeah, let's get into that for just a quick second, Tim, because if I don't live in a very diverse place, if everybody uh, looks like me and acts like me, worships like me, and then I travel or I go to a place that has more diversity, and all I know about the person uh, that I meet that's different from me is what I've learned in the media, on cable news and movies and TV, what am I supposed to think? How do I condition myself to be open to think otherwise? Well, I think the way we have to do it, you know, is to think about all the experiences we've had that were bad with people like ourselves. I mean, I hear these stories a lot, people who try to rationalize their, their racism, let's say, against black folks or against Latinos by saying, oh, well, I was in third grade and a black kid beat me up. Well, how many of us who have gotten in fights or arguments or had bad experiences with someone of a different race or ethnicity have also had dozens of those experiences with other folks who were white? How many times have we been ripped off, you know, by white landlords or treated badly by a white store clerk or treated badly by a white boss? My guess is for every time that we've had a bad experience with the so-called other, we've had several with people who were just like us. If we will keep that in mind and realize that we are, what we're doing is we're generalizing when it's someone different, but we're not generalizing when it's someone like ourselves, then we can catch ourselves in the act of doing that and we can prevent acting on the basis of that bias, which is to say we can prevent ourselves from actually discriminating. To be fair, I, I've had uh, equal opportunity beatings in high school. I think I had my head put in a toilet by every race Absolutely. And, and gender, <laughs> Tim. Uh, what, Absolutely. What, 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 what can we learn from this? Is this a teaching moment? Are we making a too big of a deal of, of these firings? Shouldn't we be talking about them? I mean, that's why I wanted you to come on the show tonight to discuss this. I feel like this right. can be a teaching moment. It can be. I mean, we've got to talk about anti-Islamic bias. I mean, clearly, anti-Muslim bias and, and prejudice is a real problem. But we're not going to make it go away by acting as if somehow people don't have that. And we're not going to make it go away in the case of the folks at NPR by getting rid of Juan Williams as if to say, oh, it's okay for those people over at Fox to express their biases. But God forbid our nice white liberal organization that we would have that. So we've got to exclude them. The reality is all the data on this says that whether you're liberal or conservative, right or left, the vast majority of us in the United States, and it's probably true around the world, have internalized biases against all types of so-called outgroups, minority groups, whether it's racial, ethnic, religious, sexual, etc. And so if we want to deal with that, let's deal with it. If we don't, fine, but let's not act as if by excluding the Juan Williamses of the world from the conversation that we're going to actually further the cause of equity and justice, because we're not. But it should be okay, though, right, Tim, to, to, to have these feelings uh, and not be labeled a racist, the R word, or even a bigot, right? right. I mean, you don't, if you're having these feelings, it doesn't mean that you are actually a racist or a bigot as long as you acknowledge them, right? Right. Well, I try to, I try to separate the act or the thought from the individual. A lot of people, you know, think about it, most of us have told a lie in our lives. Most of us have cheated on a test in school. That doesn't mean that we are liars and cheaters at our core, right? There's a difference between having this sort of core character flaw and doing something that's really messed up. Most of us are good people, but good people can do messed up things. Good people who are not racist or sexist or classist or homophobic at their core can still say things and do things right. that are racist or sexist or homophobic. That's what we need to focus on is the behavior. Instead of this idea that we've got a bunch of horrible, awful people. Most racism is perpetrated by people who are not horrible, awful people. They're good people who don't even realize the way they perpetuate the kinds of biases, the kinds of stereotypes, and the kinds of injustices that they do. As always, Tim, thanks for the lesson. I appreciate it, you man. Bet. Always great talking Thank to you. you. Timwise.org, by the way. Oh, I'll forget the expression, man up. How about woman up? There's a 20-year-old student leaving the dudes in the dust this week. Is she just plain awesome or is she crazy? We'll see you on